was kind of the gist of the email I got, but it also does make a lot of, of sense. I mean, the option for it has been there. Um, I just didn't have it as firmly in place. So, you know, Saturn, <laughs> hello, Saturn, more Saturn, which is a beautiful thing sometimes. Okay, we have made it today safely to the internet and hopefully it will be complication free. We shall see, but welcome everybody to today's eat and greet. We're hopefully in the next hour, we're going to give you something that is worth the time that you took to show up on such a beautiful Friday. Where's Saturn, Venus, they're in conjunction. We've had an interesting Scorpio moon situation this week. So what a nice Friday to roll into. I mean, SJ, do you agree? How was, how was your week? Uh, it's been it's been quite a week, I think. I mean, this um, Scorpio moon has been quite intense, and I know a lot of people I'm close with and online and stuff have uh, were discussing maybe feeling that heavily earlier in the week. Um, and so I think this was a little bit of a relief here before we hit this big climax. Obviously, the new moon with all the planets in Aquarius, sure. we get next week. So I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad we're, we made it. And yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. It's so fun. Cause it's, you know, you're another one of the astro friends that I made this year because we were all basically shut down and had to be online. So we've really had time to connect and stretch our fingers. And where are you in the world? Where are you living? So I'm, cur I'm currently in a city called Skopje in North Macedonia. It's the country just North of Greece and just South of Serbia. So it's a lovely city. It's a right here with some mountains around it. It's, I mean, I, it's a great, great place. People should get here when they can, or you know, when it's safe to travel. So, yeah. Are you are you hosting? Are you inviting to host us? <laughs> We're coming right uh, you know, now. <laughs> you know, if I one day, one day. Um, yeah, one day, right? But how yeah. cool! There you are. You're you're just between, you know, you're in Macedonia essentially, and we're here hanging out on the internet, getting to meet because of the things that happen. I think a big thing for me is that 2020 was so intense. 2021 still has its intensity, but highlighting the good things that have come out of our our transition and getting to meet a lot of different astrologers from across the globe, I think, has just been amazing. So. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to be here. And it's real important to focus on the good because the bad we all know, we've all experienced, but there's so much good stuff. So I love I love that uh, hearing that. So thank you. Yeah. Well, guys, we're going to get in here. And today we're going to talk about the moon in electional astrology. And what is this? What is its significance? How do you work with that? I mean, in terms of timing too, you really do have to pay attention because the moon is whipping around. So it is moving so fast. And as it comes and it hits and it makes contact with things, you know, one minute you're in a lunar T-square and then it's gone. So you have to, you know, pay attention to what's going on. So we're going to dig in and talk about that today. But before we do that, I want to just say, oh my goodness, we're in the last 48 hours of the kickstart right now. And we are almost there. We're about $1,700 short, which is just, it, it's mind blowing how this community has come together to get this thing funded. And so we're almost there. We've got new teachers who jumped in as well. If you didn't hear about it today already, um, Alex Trenowith. We've got Linda Bird who jumped in and just before I got on with you, Patricia Walsh has decided she'd like to come and teach from the evolutionary perspective as well. So man, it is going to be a year just loaded with teachers, loaded with good content. So if you haven't had a chance to see everybody who's coming, what we've got going on with the Kickstart, there's a link in the description box down below. And as we're going through, I'll put it in the chat as well, just so you can check it out. Now, if you're here and you wouldn't mind hitting that like button, it always helps the channel, helps the video, helps this be seen and help share the content. So I would absolutely love that. And last, but certainly I think the most important, thank you so much for always showing up. You guys, the astrology soulmate family is always at the eat and greets. I appreciate you. Thank you for sharing the content and interacting with us and make sure when you uh, leave today, you go check out SJ's channel. Cause he has got some good jams going over there. Your, your weekly reports. I'm like, I'm so mercurial. I'm like in and out. I'm like, don't do drugs. Here's the astrology and the moon and be good. Okay. <laughs> and yours are like this delicious, slow peel into what's going on. So I just, I just love it over there. I just watch you and I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> that is wonderful. Tell me more. 
Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, I deliberately try to create an energy with the video. So it's more of a kind of a feeling as well as it's not necessarily as left brain of a, of a delivery. There's a whole energy to it. And um, I try to stay about 30 minutes, less than 30, maybe about 25 minutes is my is the goal I'm trying to hit. So not too long, not too not as long as some others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I know, which I just always find masterful in the first place, because you know, as we're out here and we're doing this, we, we find our niche with these things. And I'm like, no, I am your hard hitting. You've got eight minutes. Here's what's coming up this week in and out. But then also being able to expand and say, and if you feel like you want a little bit more, check out my friend over here, check out this. Like we just are such a big resource to each other. I think. Yeah. It's like one of the great things. I think as someone was tweeting recently, but this is the best time to be alive as an astrologer astrology student or a practitioner uh, enthusiast because there's so much out there and we're all sharing and intermixing it's wonderful so i, yeah. I agree yeah. yeah absolutely well gosh we better get into this because okay. i know how astrologers are and we yeah. talk a lot so <laughs> we better get into this so i just want to hear first of all i ask everybody how did you get into this thing how did you get into astrology yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'll try to keep this short. I've, um, so let me just, you know, I was a tarot a practitioner and serious student of the tarot for about five years um, before I realized through that study that the astrological symbolism, as I had learned it in the tarot community, was insufficient. And that came about by meeting this astrologer, Dr. Jen Zark. People uh, may uh, know her, but we met uh, through a group of friends. It was not an astrology conference. And, and we spent a weekend uh, with each other at a festival in Boise, Idaho. And a few talks with her, it just something got triggered. I, I like to say the bug bit me and that mm -hmm. she was my initiatrix. And from that moment on, it's just been full speed steam ahead, a uh, serious student. I, I saw, I can tell you just one little thing I'll say. She introduced me to the idea of the 12 year uh, Jupiter cycle through the signs. And it unlocked some things for me about some cycles I had experienced in my own life um, that, that were so profound and on point that that's really what showed me I needed to, to go deeper. And then once you start going deeper with it, it's just, it's like that, right? It, I've just gone down the hole and I've never come back out of it so yeah absolutely oh my gosh and I tell you what um I know that when I got introduced to that Jupiter cycle and then I laid that with perfections I was like <laughs> you know it just the detail the nuance so I get it but when the bug or those moments like you said they just unlock another place where you're like oh things hold on I must know it's wonderful yeah it's and it's and yeah, just to say, I mean, it's the thing it keeps giving. I mean, like that insight, I get that so often now with new techniques or seeing new facts with clients and just in my own life that it's it's like astrology is real and then it's reconfirmed all the time. That's why I'm still in love with it and I'm so excited about it. So Yeah. So how did we arrive at this topic? I mean, I know how we arrived. We talked about it. But for you, what is it about the moon in this particular process? <laughs> so um, my, my background, I started studying uh, Hellenistic astrology pretty quickly after I um, was initiated. And that system um, is one where you have seven traditional planets as the primary planetary points that we look at. And within that system, the moon is just quite important. Um, the ancient electional astrologers, so the earliest books we have writing about electional astrology is where I focused because that was just part of the body of literature that I was studying. And that's where this arose. Um, and as I began studying it, I just started seeing some connections and making new connections. And then I kind of developed my, I think it's, I, you know, it's, 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 it's somewhat of a, a take that might be different than other people's takes, but it's out of that study is really how I came about it. And the other thing is that, I mean, if we're going to practice astrology, why wouldn't we start using it to um, help us in the actions we're taking. And so that just felt very natural to me as an application yeah. uh, for the work. 
Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. You want to screen share and, and let's get in here. And I just love your slides, by the way, because I'm so visually inclined in the first place <laughs> that I just loved them when you were showing them to me. I'm like, oh, let's get in here. This is going to be wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And this is like the most visually compelling. I always have, it's like the title of a book where you have the nice visual, uh, but you'll see here. So this, yeah, this is the talk by the light of the moon. Selene is the Greek name for the moon. So in the Greek text, you'll see that as the name when they discuss the planet, the moon. So that's why I have Selene and astrological timing here. Um, and by the way, I had about 10 slides that I deleted. They were all about Mercury <laughs> and Mercury as the messenger, Mercury as the planet of astrologers and how astrologers are these kind of um, perf uh, performers or jokesters in a way. And I was making an analogy between astrology and stand-up comedy about how we deliver meaning and truth through these kind of translations of symbols. And so I, I deleted all those slides because of time, but yeah. uh, I just wanted to give the idea here briefly. So you knew that that was part of the background here. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So you're like a real life astrologer. You're like, all right, we're up to a hundred. We've got 20 minutes. Let's take out these last 60 and it'll be perfect. <laughs> exactly. And people, and it's, it's so fun. I, I have a hard time talking about astrology and not finding my way into Mercury because that is our planet in the ancient system. That's this messenger of the gods. And, you know, that's what we do. We translate and we, and we deliver meaning. So, um, but we have to kill our darlings as they say yeah. <laughs> when, we, when we write. So I started here. This is the slide I, I started off with. And this is, I, I do want to start with this. This is the idea of spirituality. And I love the definition of what is spiritual uh, relating to things that are not material or physical things. And I just think it's important to bring this in when I talk about astrology, that I do think it's a necessarily a spiritual practice because we're not simply examining material objects, the planets, like with telescopes. We actually are uh, making it a, an internal process you know, where meaning is, is, a, is interior and meaning is very personal and different from each individual. And so it, there is this non-material side to what we do. And um, so I left this, it was kind of a conclusory slide for that initial introduction, but I wanted to leave it here just for people to ponder it. I think that the spiritual component is essential. Um, mm -hmm. so, and I don't know if you want to say anything on that, but I can, I, uh, you know, I know you're a very spiritual person, Stormy, and you have kind of a spiritual frame. That word is hard to define. That's why I brought the yeah. definition here. Uh, it but. is, it is hard to, it's interesting because I feel like it is hard to define, but easier to describe. You know what I mean? Because like when we drop into this place that is beyond that material, space, which I think when we look at it in astrology, at least when I do, moving into the spaces of lunar energy, I feel like is just easier to get to that, that non-material connection with the spirit. So I love that you have started with this because while I don't know that I can always define it, I know when I talk to another human being who has had that deep, impactful lunar experience we we talk about it in the same way yeah mm. absolutely and, and let me just keep going here because there's a little bit more to it i want to add here so spirit has a latin root of spiritus and that in latin means breath um, and the thing about the moon when you start looking at hellenistic astrologers so vedius valens is the one that has the most um, writings about what the planets are directly he gives lists of significations but he says the moon is breath and so already we're dealing with spirituality in terms of its origins being connected to the moon through the breath. And, um, you know, this song dancing in the moonlight, I'm not, uh, I just, <laughs> you, have you heard this one? I it, just, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I was going to sing a little bit, but I'm glad you did. So I you saved me from, from doing that, but uh, that's it. You know, and I, and, and I think there is something here with the moon kind of giving us that the dancing is about spirituality and you know, it's feeling, let the spirit move you and grooving with the spirit, you know, and, um, and, but I think it's key here that there were, we're being moved by a spirit, by the breath, and that's what inhabits the body. The other thing I wanted to go uh, talk about is this signification of the moon as the human body itself, it's very important when we start talking about electional astrology, because here's Firmicus Maternus, another great ancient astrologer, wrote in Latin, an attorney. He goes in and talks about how the moon is a container. It's actually a physical container for the divine spirit, the life-giving breath that comes into the body. 
and we have this container that holds that, that energy of that spirit. And so for me, why it's important is that when we do an election, you know, we're picking a time to initiate something, but that becomes the inception chart, like a horoscope and um, of that project, let's say. And if we don't have the moon safe and protected in those charts, the container for the spirit of that endeavor, it has cracks and can't contain that spirit. And so um, I wanted to just add this, it's this essence of the human body. He says, we, therefore, we must carefully observe the movements of the moon in order to explain the whole essence of the human body. That would include the breath and many other significations of the body. Um, let me just go, let me just uh, jam through here because there's a couple more on this point. And I want to just say here that this story came out this week. I don't know if you saw this one. I tweeted about it, but the lunar yes. cycle has distinct effect on sleep studies suggest Natalie Grover, the guardian. This was uh, late July, January, 2021, but we're seeing the science confirm that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that the moon is so important to our bodies. Yeah. I just, uh, I laugh. I just giggle a little because, you know, we're just out here in this realm. So as this came out, I was like, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> of course. I mean, you can look at any astrology enthusiast, even at the beginner level, and they say, yeah, it's crazy. Every month around this particular planetary ingress of the moon, I, I feel a little this, or I do a little this, or man, it's so weird. I just, I felt like all the air went out of my tire. Oh God, the moon was void, you know, or just whatever it is. So it's like, of course, but now we have that material plane science to go behind it and kind of pull it, you know, a little bit more solidly together for the, for the general masses. So, but the ancients knew this, you know, the ancients knew this. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's just, it's powerful, you know, and this is part of, I think, why is that I, you're just a couple other, just some, some uh, facts here. The, the moon has a gravitational pull that it generates the tidal force of the ocean. So it's moving that water and the human body, 60% water, the adult human body, um, the brain and heart, 73% water, even the bones have water, 31%. And so that the moon would, it's pulling through that gravity. I think there's, it just is another maybe scientific, and I'm not a scientist by any means, but I just throw this because I think it's worthy of contemplation. Maybe a scientist would come in and dispute this, but I think we can hear it on another level, especially against the backdrop of these ancient significations of the moon being the body. This might be more some of the science behind that. Um, so I want to come here. Um, Vedius Valens also talks about the moon ruling foresight, vision, gains, and he says the moon rules the stomach. But I'm interested here, particularly in foresight and vision, because these are things like intuition, things like uh, in our body, we get uh, evidence or we, we get messages about the future, about what may be happening in the future. And you see here, there's another science article. I feel kind of guilty bringing science into it, but that's just the society we're in. Everything, when you throw a science article, it maybe makes connections for people. Uh, but this was an article in Forbes 2017 and all about the gut. And there's a complex neurotransmitter system in the stomach of the gut. And that's why we have a gut feeling because it's the second brain there. And so the moon signifies the stomach, the breath, the body itself. And this is what we can listen to for messages about the future. Um, and, you know, uh, this slide, let me just go here, these planetary spheres. The other thing about it is the planet, I think I think I had another point here. Okay, I guess I'm not sure where that slide went. My, my thing was, is that electional astrology is very much about that. It's about the future. We do something in the present. We, we are perceptive about in a present moment. That is to say that where the planets are, so we can influence potentially the future or at least make the future better. We have a hope for, for kind of um, changing the future by being perceptive in the now. And that's what that stomach gut analogy I think is. If we listen to our bodies, we can so we get messages about what decisions to make or not to make. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I'll just say here, this is the other part of the ancient cosmology. There was something called celestial spheres. It goes back all the way back in the Greek records. Aristotle was big on them. Plato was big on them, but the, their cosmology was that we're earth is um, encased with these spheres above us and they were assigned to the planets. There's, there's seven planetary spheres and there's many others that relate to angels and fixed stars and all kinds of other stuff. But the moon and Mercury are the two closest planetary spheres to human beings. The moon is the closest. Mm. And so it's another thing of just how sensitive we are to the moon's movements. 
and another reason why the moon is so important. Uh, so this is just some of the conceptual background before we start j jamming into charts and some, uh, some other astrological technique. Um, I don't know, Swami, how does this relate to some of your astrological work? I mean, is the moon, is this a uh, jibe with kind of some of the, the, the lunar side of what you've studied? And Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, my initiation into astrology was through the lens of evolutionary astrology. So of course that's working with those nodes, but also, I mean, well before my kind of entrance into that, I think it is, it was just an, a very, um, root level understanding. And I spent a lot of time with um, the Lakota Indians. Uh, and so learning about the nature cycles and what it means to be in nature and when we do things and why we do things at this particular time, it was like that you cannot miss that following the moon and understanding the moon. I am a woman. I cannot miss and understand the moon cycle. You know, so these kinds of things, I really like to work smarter, not harder. So I feel like connecting to an understanding of, of the lunar energy first is, is really very good to help us make the journey any place else that we need to go. And like you said, you know, even in the science and that gut check or that intuition check or whatever it is, I do feel like, and I find in my practice with people, when we talk about it and we tap into the moon, it's like, oh, I couldn't mercurially see it that way. But when I check in here, when I check in in my gut, that's right. You know, so this is just, I feel like it's a huge piece of my practice. I also start my practice with hemisphere analysis and lunar phase. <laughs> so it's big. <laughs> cool. Yeah. But yeah. And, and it's, and that's the thing too. I mean, there's so many different schools and approaches. And I talk about that since some later slides that it's like finding a way in and just kind of getting something you can hold on to to work with is important. And that's what I hope with this talk. It's not a full, it's not full coverage by any means, but it's trying to give just an entryway that's tangible and useful um, against the, the you know, multiplicity and the, you know, innumerable astrological factors that, that are in play. Um, so let me just come down to the next slide here. So um, this is what I, this is the slide I was looking for. It's essential when examining the spirit of a thing, uh, the moon is, and it signifies knowing of the future, et cetera. And this is what I had said earlier. I, I jumped forward here I was, I, with that slide. So let me just go on here, which just is the moon is it's like looking in the present to affect the future. We use the moon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Real quick, on just some background on electional astrology, what is it? Well, it's basically finding a time for an action. Um, most of the time, it's thought of as a precise uh, time to act, literally like to sign a paper or to press send on an application or to say, I do. It's we're really trying to find one, one moment. But sometimes it can also be a pocket or window of energy. So like an astrology conference, they'll often get together and try to elect for like a they weekend. Or, yeah. Yes, they do. <laughs> That's it's real, you guys. Yeah, it's like the, the, the opening ceremony, you certainly want that moment to also be powerful for the election, but you also want the whole weekend, you know, um, the, the, the larger pocket of energy. And so it changes the analysis if you have like four or five days you're trying to elect for. Um, so, yeah, and I, I don't know if um, I remember UAC 2018. Were you were you at UAC 2018? Mm -hmm. No, okay. no. Uh, it was just it was that was the only astrology conference I've been to in person and it was like a grand water trine with Neptune. And oh. I, for, I, I forgot, I think Venus was involved, but clearly they had, they had picked that period and it was applying over a few days. And so it was really nice energy. Um, so let me just come down the next slide. I want to show you here. It's, it's just still more about electional astrology, a little bit of background. So Joan Quigley, some of you guys might know who Joan Quigley is. She's probably the most famous electional astrologer of the last century because she was Ronald Reagan's astrologer. And her practice uh, emphasized electional astrology, but the exact moments to take an action. So she would tell Reagan to like uh, fly at this time. It was, he had a famous, a famous inauguration ceremony when he was gov governor of California that started at like 12.30 AM. And people were like, what is, what is this? But then it came out later, he was using an electional astrologer. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I really think, I really think we have more astrology in the undertones of the United States than, than we presently know about, but I think we'll find out. I think yeah. we'll find out. Yeah. 
I'm with you there. And, and, you know, even all the way back, the uh, signing, they say there was, they were astrologers, some of those guys. I think Ben Franklin was, he had those almanacs and there was astrological stuff there. So, mm. um, you know, it's, and that's, you know, talking about like the earlier you're mentioning Lakota and just, just how every tradition really of, of humans, every human society, I think has astrologers and astrology. Mm -hmm. It's part of that society, even if it's not centered, you know, it's maybe on the margins or you can find it there in that society. There's people looking at the sky and navigating it and interpreting it for meaning. And, right. Right. you know, it feels yeah. good, doesn't it? As an astrologer to know that, you know, we're not, we're actually um, a key part of the human experience. We're not something that's just some oddity, you know? Right. Yeah. We're not just sitting over here with our hemp and henna and hoping it works out. It's like, <laughs> there's really a whole situation going on. And I love it because I agree with you. I think that in every grouping, there is the astrologer, even if they are the unintentional astrologer, if they're like, no, I'm an astronomer. I'm like, yeah, but you keep telling people that every time the sun's over there, this happens. You are an unintentional astrologer. Yeah. Boom. Busted. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love so, it. Yeah. So, so let me just, so, so this is the next slide. So this is the rest of the talk. It'll be a little bit more technical. And these are the three texts that um, are going to be the basis of the talk. These first two. So Dorotheus of Sidon, this is kind of the essential, maybe first appearance of the electional astrology as we understand it today. He has a book five here is called On Inceptions. And it's a whole book about electional astrology. This guy, Hephaestion of Thebes, um, book three, his book three is on, on Inception is what it's called. And that, it came a little later, I believe, but it's influenced by this text. And there's, a, I'll save the translation um, history, but we don't really know sometimes with like the Dorotheus text, this may be a medieval text that was, so there may have been additions in. Um, but this Hephaestion text, we think is pretty clearly from that time. And I believe this is around, it's in, late in the Hellenistic period, so probably 400, 500. I don't have the exact date up on that. Dorotheus is probably first century is where, where uh, some of the early fragments of Dorotheus. And then this book is called the Picatrix. It's a book of astrological magic for about the 11th, 12th century. But the writer of this book says he looked at all the books available at the time. And this covers a lot of stuff, not just elections, but these are the three I'll be pulling from. And I want to just mention that text is important to astrologers. We all have our libraries. You talk to an astrologer, they love their books. They buy a ton of books, but <laughs> you know, there's room for innovation and texts aren't the end all be all. I'm totally open to some of the cool work being done by people like vibrational and using computers to make new connections, but text can be important. You know, it's a record. So like what we were just talking about, this is a record of some of those astrologers and how they worked and what their wisdom was. And so my formula for learning is you use text, but then you apply it, you work with charts and maybe even abandon text, but it's a combination of the two. And that's how we learn. Yeah. Um, and, and so I just want to say that I'm going to be a little text heavy here, but just know this is not like gospel. I mean, people can throw all of this out and do their own work at any time. Okay. Absolutely. But it's always nice to have a roadmap. And as we continue to study on, we do want to have the opportunity to go to the depth of, of the next set of texts that someone's experienced. And so I just, I love that you brought these. We can see them on screen. You guys check them out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and I think there's like, it's contained the spirit of that astrologer and that their wisdom, it gets into the text. So it's, they're like living works and there is something transmitted through them that can be very valuable. Um, so here we go. This is how, this is the kind of the summary of the whole talk. The main idea, if you leave the talk, this is the one idea I want you to keep so that it's that you keep the moon safe in your elections, keep that moon protected and safe, make your moon strong in the elections. And um, Dorotheus, and, and this is a quote from him, he, then he mentioned the condition of the moon and her corruption, and one should not begin the exception or work or any matter when that is discovered until the condition of the moon and her Lord is suitable. And then Picatrix, the foundation of all of this is you see that um, the moon is safe from Saturn and Mars and their aspects. So it's a very high level idea that um, take this away um, if you're just as a basic principle, okay? Um, and so let's start getting in here. I wanted to start with the talk, um, the technical side about, uh, a little bit about aspects. And so in the Hellenistic tradition, we have something called sign-based aspects. 
I want to get a little bit into some of the aspect theory because it's interesting and it's useful and it will kind of be important to understand how I work with the moon. But Absolutely. yeah, Ptolemy, book one, chapter 16. I like the Ashman translation. It's free online. Um, he goes in and explains what, how um, aspects happen. And for Ptolemy, it's about signs and their affinity. And so the reason why, and I'm going to, and these quotes, I won't read any of these quotes, but I'm just going to show you on this next, here's a horoscope, a blank horoscope. And um, yeah, Can I go ahead. just interrupt you for a mere sure. moment. Okay. The chat box is going crazy down here because we are all realizing the excitement that we have just hit over our $30,000 goal. So we are funded and they were like all of this excitement and he doesn't know, tell him congratulations we made I'm, it excellent i'm so excited for for the project for you stormy for all the students this is going to be so exciting for them and wonderful just wonderful um, and for you too because you are on board for this yes i i, I will be help i'll be a, in a role and i appreciate i'm honored to do that and so excited about that too getting to connect with the students you know it's so lovely when you teach to have people that you can transmit something to and that they transmit things back, you know, and so it's just such an on, um, it's a, it's a role that I'm very excited uh, being about. Thank you for, for having me and for asking me to be a part of it. Absolutely. Now also in the chat, they're like, but we're also very excited about this content. So let's get back to it. I won't interrupt with any more excitement. <laughs> okay. Awesome. No, it's, it's uh, okay. So let me come back. So this is the idea. I mean, we can go back to the Ptolemy quotes. I don't think that's going to be the best use of time, but the basic idea is that you can look at the signs and I'm not going to break this down in simplistic terms, but each sign has a mode that is assigned that is cardinal, fixed, mutable. Each sign has a, a sect um, a, a assignment. So that's day or night. Um, and each sign has a, an element. Those are the three categories of how we uh, uh, you know, put the signs into groups. And if you notice here um, on a horoscope, let's just go with, Vir this is Virgo rising. That was random. I uh, love you Virgos out there too. So I'm glad that this <laughs> came up. <laughs> um, so, what we, in, in the ancient system, we would say that anything in Virgo does not aspect anything in Leo because they are um, right next to each other. It's actually based on geometry, but basically um, the 12th house, the second house, and this is the whole sign house system, by the way. Um, but even setting aside the house division, if we just want to say that the zodiac signs aspect each other, we can just think about that for now. Virgo does not aspect Leo, does not aspect Libra. Um, by a Ptolemaic aspect, that's conjunction, uh, sextile, square, trine, um, and opposition. There is conjunction, sextile, square, trine. There's five Ptolemaic aspects. And so um, if you notice here, and then it's the eighth house and the sixth house, so it's Aries and Aquarius. But look at this. What is Virgo? Virgo is earth, it's mutable, and it's of the night sect, okay? None of the signs here that Virgo does not aspect. So all, so all of the signs it doesn't aspect, they don't share any of those qualities. Leo and Aries, they're fire signs. They're not earth signs. Mm -hmm. Libra and Aquarius are air signs. They're not earth signs. Neither, none of those four signs are mutable signs. So they don't share that affinity. Um, and none of them are night sex signs. They're all of the day sex, fire and air. And so this is the rationale, a fundamental rationale mm -hmm. in the ancient system as to why planets don't as uh, aspect each other when they don't, uh, when they aren't in signs that have affinity. And it's and it's why we use sign-based aspects. Okay, um, and let me just move it forward one more slide because I think I think I have another a few more. So so the idea here, and this is where I, I really love this idea conceptually, is that when a planet is in a sign. It's uh, think about the zodiac as infrastructure. It's like the buildings of the city, all right? When a planet is in a sign, it's inhabiting a house or a building in that infrastructure. And this aspect communication model, um, you can think about it as houses having an ability to contact other houses in this city, in this infrastructure. And when a planet is in a house or a building and it can't, doesn't have a phone connection to another sign, it can't make an aspect to the, plan, the other planets that are in that sign or it makes 
these other aspects when there is that infrastructural connection. That is to say, planetary or sign affinity, I zodiac sign affinity. I okay. love that vision. I can't call you. No connection. Yeah. There's just no connection. Now we do have something called antitia and contra antitia, but let's that's for a separate talk. That can connect sometimes one degree when in some of these signs that don't make a Ptolemaic aspect, but um, that's let's set that aside. Um, and so that is the basic idea here is that is that they don't have the capacity um, to communicate. All right. So that's sign based aspects. You know, this goes a lot deeper. I mean, we could we could do now a presentation on the counter arguments with the degree based <laughs> aspect people. And I'd love to do that and go through and really, you know, but that can be maybe a lesson uh, later. OK, um, <laughs> for your next visit. For the next visit, uh, and, and maybe we could get someone on. It would be nice to explore that. But there's texts, and there's debates about texts, and that's the other thing. Astrologers love to debate texts. No, mm -hmm. he means this, or she means this, and not this. And um, so, okay, let me just jump down. Next slide. So, um, and this is the thing where I really love Richard Tarnas. You know, he's such an important astrologer, and he, I love, he expresses this idea so uh, powerfully, but in his book, Cosmos and Psyche, his seminal work, he talks about the quadrature aspects. These are the squares and the oppositions as being the, he calls them potentially critical interaction or hard between two planetary archetypes. And his work is all about these hard aspects and how when you have, a, and, and so why, let me just, let me just come back in here. Um, this is why I think conceptually all of, if a planet is squaring off with another planet, they're in signs that are of the same mode. Right. If a planet is opposing a planet's signs of the same mode. And so it's like this competition between the energy of that mode. And so take, for example, Aries, Libra, Cancer, Capricorn, that cardinal axis. And in the whole sign house system, this would be those houses would comprise that. They all want to initiate. That's what cardinal signs do. But there's competing initiations. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you have, for example, a planet in Libra and a planet in Aries, one wants to initiate that marsh is filtering through a martial initiation strategy. The other one's filtering th through the Ven Venusian style of initiation. And that's a competition because you can only, you know, you can't start 10 things at once. As you know, you're really focusing on or if you do, they're going to compete for your time. You know, if you have two big projects you're starting. So that's part of the conceptual concept, concept behind why hard aspects are critical and why those diff, those, it's hard. It's difficult. Those are difficult interactions. You know, you have these competing forces um, happening in these in these quadrature dynamic aspects. OK. Um, and so let me go back now to um, this is this thing is uh, Saturn restriction, loss, cold. Saturn signifies a lot, but this is kind of its essence you know, separation, uh, restriction and isolation, loss, old age, Mars, violence, uh, separation through like cutting away or breaking away, uh, impassioned action. You know, if you take an action, you're leaving the stasis of the moment to move forward into something new. So think about this for a second. If we have the moon, we're going back to the moon now, and we want to keep the moon safe. And, and remember the breath of the act, the, the container for the spirit of something we're initiating. Do we want the moon having to deal with a right. uh, quadrature hard aspect with restriction, loss, or cold, or violent separation and passion action? I, I don't think we would want that, you know. And so this is yeah. a, it's me with the, that. Thank you. Yeah, and and it's not to say that. And remember, this is electional astrology, but these can be also wonderful things. I mean, through these kind of challenges, that's how life happens. I mean, if life was just a uh, was it rainbows and ice cream? I forgot the one I heard recently. Unicorns and rainbows, I think. Oh, you know, well, mine is less PG. So <laughs> okay. that's good. <laughs> okay. um, you know, we wouldn't learn. We wouldn't, you know, pain is part of life. It's part of the joy of life. And so I don't want to dismiss these hard aspects. They're very useful, and particularly in the natal context, they can be very powerful. But we're talking about starting something that we want to have safety and protection as it grows and develops. And um, this is the fun, this is the principle that you want to protect the moon. Remember when I said back earlier, the Picatrix, protect it from Saturn and Mars. This is the fundamental kind of high level choice that I like to make is that you don't want the moon in a hard aspect by sign to Saturn or Mars as a primary consideration in your elections. Okay. Um, 
and here's Dorotheus again, and this is just some textual stuff. Dorotheus lists a, a whole long list of how the moon can be corrupted in an election. But he has here, if the moon was with and in fortune that Saturn and Mars are looked at it, that means make an aspect. Um, there's a whole bunch. I'm not going to go into all of these. There's a lot here. There's a, um, let me see here. The next is, so I want to take a look at a few example charts just to show you how this can work in yeah. practice. Um, we mentioned, we mentioned already like earlier in the week that Scorpio moon, the moon was in fall ruled Ooh. by the Mars and in, in its Ooh. exile, <laughs> squaring the Aquarius pile up. And yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> Some of the toughest energy, I think, in, a, in, a, in quite a while uh, in terms of my read and, um, you know, shout out to everybody out there, you know, take care of yourself. You, you know, that was a real um, climax in a way, um, you know, and next week will be probably this new moon is going to be tough too, but um, just love yourself out there through it. I think it can help knowing for, for me when I know the astrology is tough. I just, it's like, I want to give extra doses of self-love you know, make sure my self-talk is okay, or it's working with some of the negativity, you know, um, it can just help knowing what's happening because it's not, there's relief that is, is promised in that knowledge. Um, okay. Sorry, a little inspirational rant. No, there. Me... I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm here for inspiration. When we're talking about these hard moments, that is how I try and deliver the info. Yeah. So I'm going to just go through some of the big events in American history over the last 60 years. Three charts. These are probably some of the bigger ones. Assassination of JFK. Moon was co-president with Saturn, right, in Aquarius. So and we won't go deeper in the chart. I just want to show you how this lunar angularity can begin. This is a grief for the nation. It was a real shock and a trauma. 9-11, yeah. uh, uh, Moon and Saturn were co-president again in Gemini. And then when the Moon later in the day ingressed into Cancer, it opposed Mars by sign. So you have these hard aspects that whole day to Saturn and Mars. Another of the big events, uh, traumatic events in American history. And then if we look at the most recent one, this is the chart. I know the coronavirus is something that was unfolding over time, but this day 311 was the day that the WHO announced that this was officially a pandemic according to their uh, system. And here you had this Libra moon was squaring that, that Capricorn pile up. And then actually 317 was when uh, the lockdowns were really starting to hit all places. The moon actually came and joined that quadruple conjunction if we look at the South Node in Capricorn. But this was a really difficult time. I mean, I think objectively for all of us and for the collective, and, and it's a little bit of a more of a slower, it's not one event like the first two charts, but you can just see how it works here. That often it can trigger, and this is a little bit of a mundane bringing some mundane astrology into this, but they're just examples because I think everybody can feel the power of these events and see, see this quadrature relationship between the moon and the malefics and how this can work, um, even if it's not particularly an electional con uh, astrological context, okay? Mm. So yeah, it's heavy and, you know, boy, we're... Uh, I think I just want to say before we move on, let me move the slide. Let's not look at that. Um, just how, uh, just I want to refocus on how the benefits of what we've gone through uh, in 2020 and 2021, just to say that again, you know, the connection with people in the digital sphere, you know, that's a, certainly a beautiful thing. The community that we have, the new opportunities with this technology that have been accelerated like with, with the school you're doing, Stormy. So that's all stuff that probably came, wouldn't have come about maybe as soon, potentially, if yeah. we didn't have the difficulty we're in. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, we've got this comment here in the chat that it talks about it, how, you know, knowing this and understanding and by begin with it helps kind of to simplify the transit tracking and when to do things. And I absolutely agree with that. Because even sometimes to spite myself or to spite thinking about it, think, looking at a chart and saying, well, where's the moon? What's the timing of what's going on? It really does bring a natural simplification. And then the circumstances like line up and it's like, well, this is why this felt like an easier breath to take. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's a very important to have to transit track, especially the moon track. And I think as, as students start using, whether it's these techniques I'm sharing or other techniques, when you uh, start saying, when you say, I want to practice electional astrology, you will have to find your key techniques that you like to get into the chart of the moment to sift through the transits as they unfold. And whatever that is for someone, I just encourage you to, to find them because 
and stay on top of them because it, just what you said, it, it will give you an ability to navigate and to, to endure and then to capitalize or, you know, um, take advantage. Those are, no, those are capitalized to take advantage. Not the, not the best words. How about to lean, <laughs> yeah, lean I, into- I get it. I get okay. it. I support yeah. that. I mean, I don't know. Okay. My Capricorn South note is like endure, <laughs> capitalize. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. F- fully experience the joy of, how about that? Something like that. Okay. Um, so, so it's, it's a wonderful, and this is, you know, like I said earlier, the, the main idea would be to protect the moon, but this could be a secondary idea as you start working with this, it's just kind of dancing. And that's why I like the dancing analogy, dancing in the moonlight. The title from the talk actually comes from a Bob Dylan song called Joker Man. Oh, okay. And he talks about dancing by the light of the moon. So this dance theme, and I cut those slides out because we didn't have time, but um, so there is a sense of dancing with the, with the reality, dancing with the flow of reality. And, and that's what is kind of a second, maybe main point, keep the moon safe, but then you kind of learn how to dance with it as you practice. Well, you're going to have uh, to, cause the moon is whipping around. You have got to, it, it's, it's one of the planets you can track the minute movements of, and usually I think be very accurate with it. Yeah, it's, 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 and that's, that's, you know, that's the closest planetary sphere, celestial sphere, I think for that reason, because it's the mm-hmm. fastest of them all. Um, and then the body stuff we all talked about too. Um, okay, so let me, let me push through here. I think I have another quote. This is a Dorothy. So this was Hephaestion trans Grimalia. That's a translator of Hephaestion. Um, this is a Dykes translation, Carmen Astrologicum Dortheus. He just says the same thing. It's a similar quote. Um, let me see. Actually, no, we're on a different point here now. Sorry, let me let me come down here. I forgot I, I jumped forward here. This is the second point. Ruler of the moon determines the outcome of the election. And this is another fundamental principle. You see it in both of the texts. And here's the quote. For the beginnings belong to changeable Selene herself, mm-hmm. but the accompaniment, the accomplishment is the powerful God of the house. And it just means the ruler is the outcome. Uh, of the election. And you find it here as well. Uh, I, I won't read with this one verbatim, but ba- basically say if the moon is weak, maybe it's initially difficult, but if the ruler's strong, it has a good outcome. And then you can, the inverse of that would be true. Well, strong moon, but weak ruler, maybe it starts strong, but then it finishes weak. So it's another big principle. We want to look at, does the ruler of the moon have some, some strength? And um, let me I actually want to talk here, this slide, I'm going to skip ahead to this, this slide, because planetary condition is actually a really complex topic. It's fairly complex with, to ask the question, how is the ruler of the moon doing? Is it strong? Is it weak? That is a really detailed analysis. There's, and I, I'm not going to go into any of that here, but just know there's things here like essential dignity. Um, I'll go into a little bit of it later when we look at some example charts. Uh, is the planet under the beams of the sun? How fast is the planet moving? Where is it in the synodic cycle or the, its phase with respect to the sun? Is it, is it retrograde? Is it direct? Um, this is where very important actually, waxing and waning. I won't yeah. talk too much about it here, but with the moon in particular, the general idea is if you wanna increase something, you would do something when the moon is waxing. So like start a business, you probably want a waxing moon. Have a marriage, you want a waxing moon. If you wanna uh, decrease something, get that moon waning. And that would be something like surgery. You're trying to decrease the, the bad thing in your body, or even, you know, this could be spiritual stuff like meditation or, you know, kind of decreasing the thought, you know, there's this distinction can be tough to play with because you can always say, I want to increase this, but decrease this, but just know this is an important consideration in elections as well. Right. It's so funny. I just will remember that, like one of the first times I was doing an election and they were going relatively well and the world is right. And this lady says, okay, I want to get, I want to have surgery, but I want to get breast implants. I'm like waxing or waning, waxing (laughs) or waning, waxing or waning, right? (laughs) Because you have to like kind of sit with it for a minute and let that percolate. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great example. That's a tough example. I'd probably go waxing, but uh, you know, I think. I went waxing. I was like, get them, get (laughs) them. Yeah. (laughs) But it's, it, you find this, I'm trying to think of like the haircut one. This is one I've seen discussion on online. It's like, do you want your hair to grow fast, went to grow back fast, or are you trying to keep it at a shorter length? And that might be, you would pick waning if you're, uh, you know, want it to grow back quite quickly. So, um, but yeah, it's always this, this inverse uh, uh, consideration. 
I usually go waxing as a general rule because I try to elect for things most of the time we want to like expand our lives or, you know, make things that last and grow. And, and yeah. um, declination is another one. This is maybe some of the modern astral. I'm just, I put this on a list. This isn't traditional necessarily, but it is a modern consideration. Um, and the point here is, is that it's very complex. There's all kinds of feet factors. And depending mm -hmm. on what school of astrology you're in, that could change. There's, it's very, very complex. So, um, I just, so let me go back now. I just wanted to mention that as I was talking about the Dorotheus and Hephaestion uh, principle that you look for the, the strong ruler, just know that's a very complex um, analysis, okay? So let me come back to, this is the key, another very key point. So a lot of modern electional astrologers or contemporary practitioners of electional astrology, they are most interested in the ascendant. Um, you see a lot of the books, uh, they want they want to have the ascendant and the ascendant Lord. That's kind of what their primary uh, factor is. And I'm not saying that's wrong at all. I just, it might be where this system or this, these ideas are a little bit different. And so I just make people aware of that. I mean, I, if you, in your study and you think that the ascendant is, it's a part of the chart that's about the body again. So we go back to the moon as the body and that container for the spirit of an act. The ascendant is certainly part of it. But I, I, I want to just show here in the text that it seems to be a secondary consideration. So it's not that it isn't important, but it's not the primary consideration according to these astrologers. And here's like a Feistion. He has a list of things. Look attentively to the lights of the moon and the master of the house she is in. So the first two things we've already talked about. And then and even the hour marker. So it's kind of a third and even like, okay. And even that, you know, um, if you go to Dorotheus, he says here um, in every inception work, look to the sun, the moon, the Lord of the two signs in which the luminaries are. And with that, look yeah. to the ascendant in the mid heaven. Yeah. And I so, was talking with um, Lee Lehman, I think when she came earlier this week about how, when I did um, the first election for a sports game that I did, of course, in public, right? Just in front of a crowd of people to see if I could just really bomb this one. And all of the considerations were made. And in the end, it came down to the ascendant. And I didn't, I don't watch sports. So I didn't know. And I ended up asking the announcer who's a sports broadcaster. I said, well, what are their colors? What are their physical colors? And he told me their colors. And I said, oh, it's going to be this team looking at having Leo on the ascendant. He said, you know, they, they are absolutely slated to lose. And I said, yeah, all right. Well, the astrology seems to think they're going to win. And they did. And they did. Yeah. Wild. Just wild. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I mean, that's, and like, if you go to, uh, I forgot the gentleman's name. He's famous for writing books on horary. John Frawley, I think. He's got a bunch of books on sports um, inception charts of a game and how you can for gambling. And that's one of his big principles is the seventh first house and which, you know, and so it sounds like that's where you were maybe in, um, that yeah. stream of thinking was, was, was operative there. Um, yeah. yeah. And so it's important. I mean, the ascendant is important. I'm never going to say like, if you have two charts, all things equal and you can get the ascendant, maybe not having Mars or Saturn in it. And you can get the ruler of the ascendant, maybe in a strong house and with essential dignity, always pick the stat always pick that. But if we're in a world where you have two charts to pick from, and I'll show you at the end, I have an example. And what's, what are you going to, you know, what's the primary consideration for me? The moon is primary. I always start there. And um, I always, that's my non-negotiable. That's what I, that's what I call these find your electional astrology, non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we, our task is. Um, and then go from there. Okay. So let me just, let me keep going down here. This, and this is the point um, sorry, this is just what I was saying. So this is Hephaestion of Thebes again. Uh, he says, use the greatest number of indications deemed powerful according to the occasion. So he basically says, um, you, can't, you can't do everything in the book. You can't get them all. And they go through all these lists. Of, it's impossible. There's literally not one chart, like in hundreds or thousands of years, that would have everything. That everything. They, yeah. <laughs> So you have to use the greatest number. And the purpose of the talk is finding a way into it. It's just what I said. So I was on this next slide. I'm glad I guess I'm, my logic when I wrote this is the same as the logic that just came out in the conversation, but we're finding our non-negotiables. And 
So let me go here, the next thing here. This is one thing I also wanna say, I haven't seen it in the text here, but this is a very another non-negotiable I have that I just wanted to add. So people that take come away from this talk know this point. You, it, whatever planet signifies naturally the thing you're electing for, you make that's a primary concern. So if you have a wedding, you don't want Venus retrograde in Scorpio, that's not a good time to elect a wedding. You, you want Venus, you know, uh, direct in motion out from the sun, out from the sun's beams and in preferably in Taurus or Libra um, or some other parts of the Zodiac where it's can be strong as well. So no mercury retrograde if you're doing business like a business initiation. So that's another primary thing. And this is a non-negotiable for me and for how I work with electional astrology. Okay. So is that, um, does that stay true for you if the person who's going to run the business natally has a mercury retrograde. It would, it would for me, um, but I would, and that's a whole nother topic of this inner relationship between electional, the, the transiting skies strength, and then how you read that against the nativity. Mm -hmm. And just quickly, I'll say what I do is I always pull up the nativity and a by wheel. And then I look for kind of where the strong houses are. And I want to see the moon, ideally, like in the 10th house, that would be perfect if it's someone's career and you're doing a business. I'd like to get that transiting moon also in that transiting 10th house for that person. Mm -hmm. Sure. But for me, it's it's if it's not the primary concern and this this different electional astrologers come down differently. Some say it's only about the nativity. Um, and and so I, I just for me, it's about the transiting strength and the moon and the safe moon as a primary concern. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. OK, so let me come back down here. So here's the two chart examples. And this would actually be great if we had Queen Elizabeth's natal chart. I, that is available. We should do a by wheel with this. But these are the two most famous electional charts in the tradition. I feel strong saying that uh, because they're the most well-known and like the most famous that we have. And it's the coronation of Queen Elizabeth I. The astrologer was John Dee, the great John Dee. And then we have the foundation of the city of Baghdad. Masha Allah and a bunch of other astrologers, a young Masha Allah and a team. They actually had a team to found that city and that uh, a team of astrologers working to elect that chart. So these are the two we're going to look at. We're going to look at them against the principles we've just talked about. Um, and let's start here with the foundation of Baghdad. We'll go in chronological order. First thing I want to note is that the moon is waxing. So we get the waxing moon. Um, and of course, you found the city, you want that. It's in the strong 11th house, um, which is important. I have a slide about that later. But the house the moon is in is also a primary consideration. You want the, the, the moon in one of the strongest houses. That's the first house, the 10th house, the 11th house, ideally, because those are on the horizon or above the horizon. And then uh, the fifth house can also be strong. Um, but different, it, the principle is just get the moon in a strong house. Um, and look at this chart. So the moon's in Libra, sign-based opposition to, it, it's, there's no angular sign-based hard dynamic aspect to Saturn or Mars. Yeah, beautiful. The moon is averse to Saturn and the moon is making a trine to Mars, an easygoing trine. And so right away, a lot of astrologers look at this chart and they say, what were these guys thinking? We can't understand the election because you have Jupiter on the ascendant, it's retrograde, but it's opposing Mars by two degrees and an applying opposition sign based. And so if we're thinking about using the ascendant as a primary consideration, then we pull this chart up, it just doesn't make sense. But when you look at it from the perspective of the moon being the primary consideration, it makes total sense. This is a lovely safe moon. Look, it's, and then we go to the ruler of the moon, Venus, it's in a mutual reception. One of the strongest conditions mm -hmm. for two planets to be in vis-a-vis -vis each other in terms of dignity. Venus here is actually very strong. It's in its own decan and it's daytime. And then water signs, Venus has day what we call day triplicity rulership. So Venus is a plus four in some of the numbering systems. It's very, it has a lot of dignity. And so right away, it explains the foundation of Baghdad chart that um, the ascendant has been deprioritized. Now you love Jupiter on the, on the degree of the ascendant, obviously that's awesome. <laughs> but the moon is kind of clearly um, doing so well here against the principles we just talked about. Now, one thing I will say about this chart, there's debates about what Zodiac was used um, and even what house system. But I, I think that if you're using a quadrant house system, you still have um, Mars in the seventh house because of the five degree rule would pull Mars into the seventh house. 
And you can tweak with the Zodiac and maybe change the sign placements and the sign based relationships. But I'm just assuming a tropical, but just, I want to give people that caveat. It's a long time ago. <laughs> um, and let me just go to the next one. You'll see the same principle. So, so I was just going to say, how could they be prioritizing the ascendant with this Mars opposition? And, I, and that just what I said, maybe it wasn't a priority um, like we see in Dorotheus, like we see in Hephaestion. And then we go to coronation of Elizabeth II. So it's the same idea here. They both have waxing 11th house moons. It tells you how powerful the 11th house is. You know, in the older text, the 11th house is patronage. It's the money you get from powerful people. Um, and that's, you can find these networks of power in the 11th house. Um, I love having the moon there. Um, but again, no hard aspects. In this case, John D. he, um, you know, snuggles away Mars and Saturn making a applying opposition, but in the sixth and 12th house, those dark houses that don't see the ascendant. So the ascendant is not only is the moon safe in this chart, but so is the ascendant from Mars and Saturn. Sure. Um, and then we look at the ruler of the moon, Mars. So Mars is very is strong in Scorpio. So it has dignity. And, and so um, the thing about this chart with the ascendant is that it's ruled by Mercury. And what was John D thinking? Mercury's under the beams of the sun in Aquarius, has no dignity, it has night triplicity rulership, but it's not nighttime. So it again tells me D was not as focused on the ascendant in term, and its ruler in terms of his electional work. It was much more about the moon, the waxing moon, the house position of the moon, and then the moon's ruler. Um, and of course, D was probably using a quadrant house system, but, but um, we can set all those concerns aside right now and just look in terms of these, these principles as if we're using this whole sign system, okay? Uh, I don't wanna dismiss those as relevant questions, but I think in this house, even if you get quadrant houses, the, the, the condition of the ruler of the ascendant is still weak. And I believe the moon is still in the, um, uh, we, we'd have to get that up. I think it's still in the- I know, house. I'm like, hold on, we have, probably have to just do actually, it. That's actually, hold, I have it teed up right now. Let me just punch this one up really quickly and I can get a quadrant house. And actually while, while I'm doing this, uh, wh where are you with the house houses, Stormy? I mean, I, um, what's your preferred house system of choice? I know that's like, a, I, when you ask an astrologer, it's like, oh, is this, you know, I'm, I totally love all house systems and right. all practitioners. Are so it's gonna not- gonna go back to like two lifetimes ago or what is the answer gonna come from this person? I'm a big fan of Placidus. I just love it. I feel like the chart lights up and starts to sing when I look at things like that. But if I'm doing a specific technique or looking at an election or of course, you know, doing like the monthlies and stuff like that, then moving into full sign is really just the way to go. And, you know, as I- practice more and more. I am friendly with whole sign, but I just don't, in terms of a personal like natal chart analysis, I just don't hear it. The chart just does not sing that way to me, but if it's like an event or something, it's like, it just lights up. So that's where I'm at today. And I really enjoy being able to say that that's where I'm at today because there's an openness to what if that looks different later, you know what I mean? So anyways, that's my response. Okay, cool. No, that's, that's great. I love that openness. And I think Jen Zart, we mentioned her earlier, she has the, I think it's called the open house system is what she's termed it. And that's just where you use the house system of the technique and yeah. whoever innovated that technique. And so that's also a nice way to go. So it looks like this is a massive 12th house in the quadrant system. I put up Placidus here, but it was the same in Regin Montanus. Uh, but, it, you know, so let's just come back to the to the conversation. I, I, I say this mainly to because people out there in the audience may be saying, listen, he's cheating. You know, this wasn't. And I just want to give them voice like, OK, we, I know that there's these questions exist. But, you know, if we're looking simply at the other way you could you could go is just saying um, why if we're using whole sign houses, we would still want to analyze any moment in time against the whole sign house model, especially if we're going to go back to the older text that where we knew very, very likely they were using that, there's still value in it for purposes of the points of the lecture and the talk. So um, I'm not, um, I just wanna, I just wanted to give them a little bit of voice there. Okay. So can you see the PPT again? Yes. Okay. So in this chart, it's the same, it's the same idea. You have the, and, and let me move to, I talked about this, the ascendant ruler, Mercury is weak, but the moon is safe from sign-based aspects. And even if you're using the quadrant house system, the sign-based aspect idea still would be in play. You know, you can have a, a 12th house that has three signs. And so maybe he was looking at John D, the sign-based angularity principle, even though he was using a quadrant house system that would still uh, 
be operative. So um, let me go to the next slide here. And this is the thing I wanted to share about the house strength. So uh, there's a different writers in the ancient texts that all rank the houses differently. This is from Hephaestion again. This is in book one from the Schmidt translation. But here's his order of the houses. He's got the first house, the strongest, the 10th house, the second strongest, the third, the 11th house, the third, the fifth house, the fourth, and so on. And it's seven, four, nine. So of the, the what is it? The first seven houses, that's the order he ranks them. So I would just as a general principle, try to get the moon in those, those best houses. If, you, if you're in a pinch, you can go down farther on this list, you know, and put it in the ninth house if you have to, or the fourth house under the horizon if you have to. Um, and so here's my summary. This is the summary of my top level rules for electional astrology, among others. So there's other things I look at too, but this is the highest level. This is a summary here. You want the moon safe from sign-based hard aspects from Mars and Saturn or to Mars and Saturn. The ruler of the moon, have give it some dignity. Even if it's Venus in Virgo with term and triplicity and decan dignity, that's, that's better. I mean, that's okay. It's, it's somewhat strong there. Make sure you have some kind of dignity with that moon's ruler and then make sure the moon's in a strong house. So that's my summary. That's based on those example charts. That's based on what we've seen. Let me see if I uh, have anything here. So this is the final thing. We're just coming back to the peak of tricks. I love this quote. The foundation of us all that you should see to it and all good works, the moon is safe from Saturn and Mars and mm -hmm. their aspects. So that's kind of the foundation. And that's kind of my principle there. Um, I've got, uh, I think, how are we on time? I've got one more, two more slides with an, uh, an example. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, okay. let's do them. We've got about 10-ish minutes left. So let's do it. Let's see them. Okay. We can do it. And then we can go to some, maybe if there's some questions. So this is an example. I wanted just to point out how this works in my life and practice. So Sormi and I were talking back when we were exploring doing this. And at the end of the call, I was, you know, I said, let's do moon and election. She was like, cool, that sounds like a good idea. And she's like, what about this week, February? And, um, and then she was like, why don't you show me your techniques? Show me, you know, I don't think she said it quite like that. She's like, well, let's see you work in action. What date would be better? And, um, <laughs> Hopefully I was a bit more diplomatic about it, you know, you were, you were, I'm just, okay, kidding. I'm just kind of kidding. No, no, I, I didn't, I, you know, but she was basically, you know, saying what she did put me on the spot and there was no pressure, but there was an invitation and an opportunity to kind of maybe use some of this stuff on the fly. Cause we were having a, a short, very friendly, very congenial call it was great. And right at the end I had to pick there. I mean, I could have said, let me get back to you. But, it, but I didn't need to, because I use these three principles that I've just shared with you. Right. And these are the two charts. I think you said, Stormy, the fourth or the fifth. And, and so, it, I mean, look at this. How easy was this choice? So Thursday, the fourth, right. you have a Scorpio moon opposite Mars and Taurus, square Saturn and Aquarius, versus the option to do it today, where we just had the moon ingress into Sagittarius. Um, you know, Sagittarius, maybe for my system, like, this choice, this chart didn't hit, it only hit one thing on my system here. And by, by the way, I don't like to have the mood co-present with the South or North node. I generally try to avoid that. If oh, I, have to... I was going to ask about that, especially at the coronation one, the moon was just yeah. scooped up there, but you know, mom, mom issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's so that if, if I had to start going now to other levels, this was the highest level. I really wanted to contain the talk there, but then that would be the next thing. I actually had a slide with Valens and some, and Dorothea is talking about the moon with the no eclipse points. We don't really want to do that. Now, by the time you get to the medieval and the Renaissance tradition, so around D's era, there was, there is actually an idea that if you put the moon with the North node, it can actually increase. It comes from uh, a principle in Dorothea about buying and selling in book five, where he says, if the moon's near the North node, you get higher prices. Mm. Excuse me. So you want to, you want to pay your, you want to sell things when the moon's with the north node and you want to like pay your debts and when the moon's with the south node because it decreases the prices. Um, and so there is an electional principle by D's time where that is acceptable and usable. I would say people uh, out there only put it, if you have to, if you're forced, get the moon maybe in these houses where there is no node. But if you have to, just with that north node would be the choice. Um, and, you know, try to get it away from it. You don't want it maybe exactly on it. Um, so, but, but we didn't have that option here. I had to just pick between these two and this is a clear winner because it's safe from, so we, we have to deal with some South node energy. Okay. We can do Ketu, we can do spiritual, we can do asceticism, um, you know, but we don't have this really, this last couple of days of that whammy 
that we all got hit this double whammy, you know, we got freed from that. So you can see how it worked in practice mm -hmm. that we were able to be here in this time. And I think the energy I can just, it's a little lighter. It's a little bit more functional. Yeah. Um, and Jupiter, you know, it's Jupiter does not have term dignity in Aquarius yet. That's coming, I think maybe next week or in the next couple of weeks, but that's something we could look at there um, to try to get, once Jupiter hits that Egyptian term, there is something to like and to maybe lean into where the next Sagittarius moon has that behind it. So it might actually be something you could consider for a waning moon election. That South node's a problem, but so this is how I used it in practice to just, as I was talking about earlier, dancing with the energy, um, clear choice. And I'm, and I'm really happy about that choice. Um, yeah. And it's wonderful because, you know, this is weeks and weeks ago and looking and saying, this is just going to be tough. And, you know, we agreed when we even got on the call, it's like, yeah, this last couple of days has been rough. And today is that that lightness that you're talking about. And today is a much better day, I think, to not be trapped under anything technologically that's trying to, that's like held up. It's just like, you know, energetic constipation. Today, we're good to go. Yeah, it's, and and you see, it feels like a climax of some things, but just some sense of a let, kind of a come down a little bit. And that waxing, that waning moons, some come down energy, the project funds, right? When the, after the moon comes into Sagittarius. So that's another example of how, you see that energy releasing and th good things are happening. Um, so that's my chart example. One quick chart example. We could go through many, many more, but let me just get to my final slide. I want to finish this. So I just want to uh, emphasize this talk is a beginning. It's just a beginning. This is um, it's a, it's a large field of study and practice, electional astrology. Like we were speaking about earlier, there's experts that deal with the first and seventh house and their rulers. That's what they want to look at. That's their primary consideration. Um, my uh, suggestion to everybody out there, you know, read text, play with example charts, find your own path. This is what I'm big on, actually, as, as an astrology educator. You have to make it your own. That's how astrology begins to light up. And that's like each practitioner and student, you have a purpose in the field. There's something out there astrologically that's trying to come through you. I love where that. You, and, and you have to give yourself, um, I want to encourage you to like step into that power, you know, like you, teachers are great. I love my teachers. Texts are great. I love my texts, but give yourself that freedom to make connections and see things that maybe people haven't seen before and present a new idea and explore example charts to support your case. And I think you'll have a, a you know, it's a beautiful thing when you start doing that. Um, and that's what I just said, making astrology your own through sincere, open-hearted exploration. That's my kind of final thought. And yeah, I mean, so, you know, this is it. Um, this is the, you know, the, the idea. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's quite an idea. And if this is a new concept to you or new information, you know, hopefully in this last just over an hour, you've gotten some new ideas that are empowering you to have that open hearted exploration with this. And if you've been studying for a hundred years, you know, what did you hear that kind of pops something open for you today as well? Cause I think that you presented it just beautifully. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And any questions uh, out there? I don't know. No, you know what? It's actually so funny. You know, after the um, announcement that the project had fund, everybody was talking about just in general, how it just feels like such a good day. There's like an ease there's, you know, just all of this going on down here. And as you're talking, people are like, this is, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you we're left with no questions today, but honestly, like a good feeling, like a good experience of having you here. So I love that. I'm okay with an eat and greet that goes that way. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and people can find me or email me or message me. And, and if they have a question later, I definitely welcome that kind of exchange. So uh, sjanderson144.com is my website. And you can find a contact, I think, there. And all my socials uh, are linked there. So message me, DM me if you want if you want a question. Yeah, absolutely. Twitter. Go to Twitter. I just am like, well, I have a question for SJ. I'll email him. I'm like, I'm lying. I'm going to Twitter. I'll find him. He's in the Twitter yeah. world. Yeah. That's a that's sometimes the email can feel like a professional obligation and then they stack up, but Twitter, DM, it's just boom, I can just write a it's less formal, so it feels like I can respond quicker without having to do more heavy lifting to make it emailable, you know? 
<laughs> Absolutely. All right, you guys, as always, I will make sure that SJ's information is below this video so that you can reach out and, and ask him questions, check out the work he's got going on. I'll definitely make sure there's a link to his YouTube channel as well. SJ, thank you again so, so, so much for coming over. I'm looking forward to what we're going to create and explore and find out together in this next year, just, just in general, not just in the Kickstarter, but just in general, you make a new friend and it's like, well, what is this going to be? You know, me too. I'm really excited, really excited. And yeah, uh, this, this year, you know, this is one of the best things about it. This uh, astrology is, I mean, it's one of the best things about life in general. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm loving it for 2021. It gets so much better. Jupiter and Pisces. We've got oh. a lot to look forward to. Venus and Pisces coming up, exalted and Pisces. So yeah, yeah, we do. We do have a lot and it's just not the energy of 2020. So that is also yeah. a real big deal. <laughs> that is brilliant. So, all right, you guys, hopefully in this last little bit of time we've been together, you heard something that you liked, that it made you feel worth taking the time that you took to show up. I hope so. I hope that you will watch back. And if you are watching on the replay, leave some comments or questions in the comment section down below. And remember, if you are on the go, you can always listen to this on the podcast in just about a week as well. All right, you guys, I love you so much. I look forward to seeing you next time. I look forward to probably blowing up the internet here in about 15 minutes with excitement. And we will see you guys in everything that is coming up very soon. Bye everyone.